Clark's class this week is Revelation, Things Which Must Shortly Come to Pass. Today's class is entitled, The Book Unsealed. Brother Neville. Well, thank you, Brother Chairman, and good, uh, good morning, my dearly loved brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know, the, uh, the only thing I actually learned out of the last class was uh, it was good and all, you know, but the only thing I actually learned was if I run out of time, I just have to say, in summary, and I buy an extra five minutes. <laughs> and I said that to the taping brother, and he said, well, that's all well and good, but I've wired you up, and if you do that, I tase you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure what I'm... Yeah. <laughs> Well, brothers and sisters, as we said last night in our introduction, we're living in momentous times. I mean, if the current events don't tell us that, I don't know what does. But these are times, of course, which not only herald the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ, but bring into relief the fulfillment of the entire plan that God has with this dispensation. For 6,000 years, the bride of Christ has been prepared. And when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, there'll be a union between the bride and the groom which will complete the 6,000 years of man's rule and usher in the next thousand of God's rule. But even as, even as I say it like that, you can detect a problem, can't you? Because the fact that the bride has been prepared for the last 6,000 years amidst man's rule betrays the fact that the bride's been developing in the, in the shadow of a hostile system sometimes in persecution, <coughs> sometimes in prosperity. But whatever the circumstances were, that bride was precious. And therefore the Lord had to write a letter to that bride so that wherever she was in the course of, this, of that 6,000 years, and particularly in this case of the last 2,000 years, she would have a vision of the future. Because as we said last night, if there is no vision, the people perish. Because the people live for the moment if they have no vision of the future. Therefore, the book of Revelation was written for that reason, for the bride. But it's not written just so that the bride can tell the future or the bride can look at the signs of the times and work out where she is in the course of unfolding Bible prophecy. The book of Revelation, in fact, when you look at a slide like this, contains the entire resolution of the whole biblical plot. The problem that was begun in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter three, is resolved by the end of the book of Revelation. So, of course, you have in Genesis 2, verse 21, the marriage of the first Adam. In Revelation 19, the marriage of the last Adam. Revelation 3, verse 1, the serpent is loose, but in, sorry, Genesis 3, verse 1, but in Revelation 20, in verse 1, the serpent is bound. In Genesis 3, 19, sorrow and death are introduced after the fall Revelation 21 verse 4, sorrow and death are removed from the world. Genesis 3, 24, the way of the tree of life is closed. Revelation 22 verse 14, the way of the tree of life is opened again. And finally, we have in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, the creation of the natural heavens and earth, spoken of directly in those words in Genesis 2 verse 1, whereas in Revelation 22, 21 and verse 4, the spiritual heavens and earth are created. So you see, the book of Revelation is more than just the union of the bride with the groom, or, or, or the proof of the fact that God's in control of history, even in the kingdom of men. It's the completion of the gospel message. It's the resolution of the problem in Eden. Far, far more significant than simply, as it were, a bride marrying a groom. But... Uh, there's more. Because whilst the book of Revelation completes or concludes the story that began in Genesis and solves the problems which arose in Genesis, it also tells us about the fact that mankind is divided into two groups. Genesis talks about the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. 
By the time we get to the book of Revelation, we realize there's a kingdom of God and a kingdom of men. And these two groups have no fellowship, no participation, no communication, a communion rather, whatsoever. And this is how that dichotomy is presented in the book of Revelation. We have Mount Zion in Revelation 14 and verse 1 versus that great city of Rome in Revelation 17 verse 18. The holy city versus the city spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. New Jerusalem versus Babylon the Great. The Lamb versus ravaging wild beasts. The Bride versus the Harlot. The God of Heaven versus the God of the Earth. Now, let me explain that. The God of Heaven in Revelation 16 verse 11 is Yahweh, the God of Heaven. But the God of the Earth in Revelation 11 verse 4 is the papacy. So these are the two opposing teams, if you like, the two opposing forces. There's a war in the book of Revelation a titanic struggle between two enormous causes. And there can be only two, and everybody ever born is on one team or the other. And of course, in this war, there can be only one victor. That's the real story, you see, of the book of Revelation. That's the major theme, and of course, that's the theme that the servants of God have to understand. That's the real story of the bride about to marry a groom. But the interesting thing, of course, is that this book's a book written in signs. Revelation 1, verse 1, he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And it's written in sign. Why? Because this is an open letter. It's an intimate letter from a groom to a bride, but published in full public view, which means the opposite team can read it. The apostasy can read it. But though reading it, she's not meant to understand it. And that's exactly what's happened, of course, because the Catholic Church reads the book of Revelation, and they think it's a description of heaven, full of angels. You, you read of in, in Revelation 21, for example, the New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, and the gates are gates of pearls. They think you go to heaven, and you go to a pearly gate. And the, the 12 apostles are around the 12 gates, and you meet St. Peter at the pearly gate. You see, they've, they've made an entirely bogus interpretation of the book of Revelation because they don't understand the symbols. So whilst they can see the letter from the bride to the groom, they can't understand that letter because it's only written to the bride, not to the harlot system. So it's remarkable, therefore, the way that God's done it. Hiding the riddle of Bible prophecy, hiding the plot of the whole drama of the Bible in full public view. Well, there's just one thing I've got to prove to you from that slide, and that's this. You will recall in Revelation 14 and verse 1 that Zion is mentioned. We have the Lamb on Mount Zion with the 144,000 who have their fa the, the Father's name in their foreheads. And I've contrasted that with the great city of Rome. The problem is that the word Rome never appears anywhere in the book of Revelation. So how do we know Rome's the apostate system? How do we know it's Rome that's the enemy? Well, I'll show you. Come with me to Revelation 17. And let's begin in Revelation 17 and verse 18, because if you're going to destroy the enemy, ultimately, if you're going to fight the enemy today, you've got to understand who the enemy is, which means we have to interpret the symbols of the enemy. And in Revelation 17 and verse 18, it says that the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Of course, John lived in the Roman Empire of the first century. Rome ruled the world. The great city that ruled the kings of the earth was none other than Rome in John's day in the first century. Well, that's a reasonable proof, but there's an even more compelling proof, I think, in this, in this very chapter. Look at verse 3. This is a chapter all about a woman riding a beast and the subsequent conduct of that woman and that beast. And in Revelation 17, verse 3, it says that he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And then across the margin in verse 12, it says that those ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Now, what's the answer of the beast? Who is the beast? What does the beast represent? Well, if you've got an Oxford Bible like mine, you've got the answer in the margin against verse 12. There's a little H, and it says, 
Daniel 7 verse 7. It's worth highlighting because, of course, that's the identification of the beast. There is only one beast in Scripture which has ten horns, and it's the fourth beast of Daniel. And this is it. The book of Revelation is very simply an amplification of the prophecy of Daniel from the fourth beast and onwards. So Daniel, of course, wrote his prophecy. I'm speaking of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. He wrote these prophecies in 600 BC, approximately. And he described the kingdom of men in Daniel 2 as a giant metallic image and gave the par parallel interpretation from God's point of view in Daniel chapter 7 as four raging wild beasts. Well, of course, by the time you come to the Apostle John in the first century of the Christian era, Babylon's gone, Medo-Persia's gone, Greece is gone, and Rome is the empire of the day, the great city that rules the kings of the world. And that beast now gets an enormous development in explanation as far as John's concerned. And so the, the ten-horned beast of Daniel 7 and verse 7 becomes the great red dragon of Revelation 12, which morphs over time into the beast of the sea of Revelation 13, which in turn morphs over time to the scarlet-coloured beast of Revelation 17. And I say morphs over time. All three of those beasts I just described, the beast of Revelation 12, 13, and 17, all bear the precise characteristics of Daniel's fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. They all have ten horns, for example. You ask me, why does the beast of Daniel chapter 7 not have seven heads? Or there's no mention made of the fact that it has seven heads, whereas the beasts of Revelation do have seven heads. The answer to the riddle is very simple. The beast, I believe, Daniel saw in Daniel 7 only had one head. The beasts of Revelation, whilst we commonly draw them with seven heads, only actually have one head at a time. Those seven heads represent seven forms of government. So the head, if you could say it like this, changes the seven colours of the rainbow, but every time bears ten horns as the form of government of that head changes over time. So the beast only, irrespective of what John actually saw, the beast in real life only ever had one head at a time. And that head was occupied by those ten horns. But you can see very simply, my point from this slide is, that the beasts of Revelation are simply an amplification over time, of the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. And there is no question that the fourth beast of Daniel 7 is Rome. And therefore what you have in Revelation 17 is a woman riding the Roman beast. That's the story of Revelation chapter 17. And that's how we can identify Rome in opposition to Zion in our previous slide. Well, all right, that's simple. That's the, the great warfare of the book of Revelation. But how does the book of Revelation break up? Well, you know, if I was to stand back at a great distance and look at the book of Revelation, the thing that strikes me is this. Every chapter falls into one of two categories. It's either a chapter of history, and perhaps if that history hasn't yet occurred, it's a chapter of prophecy, but prophetic history in one form or other, or it's a vision of the kingdom age. And every chapter fits that pattern. It's either one or the other. So chapter 1, the vision of the one like the Son of Man. It's a kingdom vision. Followed by Revelation 2 and 3, the letters to the seven ecclesias, clearly uh, now history. Present when John wrote, but history for us. Revelation 4 and 5, the throne in heaven. The man upon the throne in Revelation 4 and 5, uh, taking the seven-sealed scroll well, and opening it precedes, a vision, precedes the seven seals, which are clearly the unfolding of Roman history in the first centuries AD. Revelation 7, the great multitude that no man could number, a vision. Revelation 8 and 9, the seven trumpets, a, a further unfolding of history, you see. And so what you simply have in the book of Revelation is a great historical timeline punctuated by visions of the future. Are you going to say to me, well, if that's the case, why wasn't Revelation written in order? Why, for example, don't, di didn't John or the Lord record chapters, chapter 2, 3, 6, 8, 9, 11 to 13, and so forth, 
and then at the end collect all the visions of the future so that you can look at the book of Revelation and say there's a chronology. And the answer is this. Each of these sections on the right-hand side of that slide are slabs of history. And there were saints living in each of those portions of history. And persecution would come, or prosperity would come, or tribulation of one form or another. And in each case, there had to be a vision relevant for them to project them forward that they might understand that no matter what happened to them in their dispensation, God was in control. And so what you find then is that each of the visions in, on, on the left column precede the history on the right-hand column, by which I mean this. The vision of chapter 1 was for the seven ecclesias. The vision of chapters 4 and 5 was for the brothers and sisters living in the seal period of chapter 6. The vision of chapter 7 was for those who lived in the trumpet period of chapter 8 and 9. And you'll find verbal links between the vision and the history section that follows it. The most obvious, perhaps, well, look at this. Come with me to Revelation 1. I'll show you. If you haven't seen this before, it's a, a little task that you can do quite simply. Revelation 2 and verse 1 begins the letter to the Ecclesia of Ephesus. These things, it says, saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, as it should be. Well, that phrase, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, is taken directly from Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. It's the opening phrase of the description of the one like the Son of Man. And all the letters, all seven letters to the Ecclesias in Revelation 2 and 3, open with phrases from the vision of Revelation chapter 1. So this is the, this is the link you see. Or well, think about Revelation 4 and 5. The Lamb prevailed to open the scroll and took it from the hand of the man on the throne and when the scroll was opened, it was a seven-sealed scroll, and the first seal was burst from the scroll, and out rolls the history of Revelation chapter 6. So you see, the vision of chapters 4 and 5 is relevant for the brothers and sisters living in the epoch of Revelation chapter 6. And so it goes down through the rest of those sections. So no mystery. Revelation breaks up into two sorts of chapters. A, a history chapter, or history prophecy chapter, and a kingdom vision chapter. And in every case, the kingdom vision that precedes the history chapter is relevant to the saints who lived in that subsequent history chapter. Now let's do something. Come with me to Revelation 5. I'll show you the golden key that enables us to unlock the book of Revelation the structure of the book of Revelation. And it's in Revelation 5, verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. So this is the seven-sealed scroll that you read about in Revelation 6, verse 1. But why does it say it was written within and on the backside? Why does it tell us that? The New International Version on verse 1 of chapter 5 says, inside and outside, writing on both sides. So the scroll was written on both sides. Now, why does it say that? Well, here's the answer. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 5. When we were come to Macedonia, the apostle tells us, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side, without were fightings, within were fears. Without what? Within what? The ecclesia. Within or without the ecclesia. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 12. What have I to do to judge them that are without the ecclesia? Do you not judge them that are within? And what you find, brothers and sisters, is just in that little phrase in Revelation 5 verse 1, the great key to the structure of the book of Revelation, the scroll is written on both sides because there are going to be two parallel trains of history. A religious train of history and a secular train of history. Writing within and without concerns things of a religious and civil nature. Now, why am I laboring the point? Let's do this. Let's take those 22 chapters of Revelation 
and let's take all the kingdom visions and put them to one side, and let's just look at the history section. What do we make of it? Well, it looks like that. So take out all the visions and push them to one side and just look at the history. Chapter 6 begins from John's day, the commencement of the civil or the political history of Rome, up to the end of chapter 11, and then... Well, at the end of chapter 11, you can see I've got a number line across the top. Chapter 11 of Revelation finishes in the kingdom age. But Revelation chapter 12 jumps right back to the early years of the Christian era and charges forth again to the kingdom age from a religious point of view. So what we're saying very simply is, if you ignore the kingdom visions for the moment, the historical section or the historical chapters of the book of Revelation are two parallel timelines, one religious and the other political. Now you're going to say to me, well, that all sounds pretty good, and that might sound like a convincing explanation of written within and without, but can you prove it? Well, let me show you. Come to Revelation 11. Here's the kingdom section. Revelation 11 and verse 15. It says in Revelation 11 and verse 15, that the seventh angel sounded, there were great voices in heaven. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, it says. Well, clearly, therefore, in Revelation 11 and verse 15, we've got to the 21st century, haven't we? We've got the commencement of the kingdom age. So I've got Revelation 11 right at the very... Well, Revelation 11 doesn't start with the kingdom. Revelation 11 verse 1 is is historical for us now, but it nevertheless concludes in verse 15 with the seventh trumpet in the kingdom age. Well, what do you then make of Revelation 12? Because if the book of Revelation is chronological, you might expect Revelation 12 to be continuing to talk about the kingdom age. Well, Revelation 12 verse 3, there appears another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns on his heads. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, cast them to the ground. Is that the kingdom age? The dragons Rome. Well, how, how, how come the Roman Empire is still existing in the kingdom? Ah, uh, it's not. Revelation 12 comes before Revelation 11. It doesn't come after Revelation 11. We've gone back in time, you see. We get to the kingdom age in Revelation 11 verse 15, and we go back in time when you come to Revelation chapter 12. Let me show you something else. Come across to chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. What we're saying is we've identified the commencement of the kingdom age in Revelation 11 verse 15. We've clearly gone back in time when you come to Revelation chapter 12. So there's a disconnect. Well, what do you make of Revelation 20 verse 4? I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Well, that seems to me to be remarkably parallel to Revelation 11 verse 15. Because it says in Revelation, in verse 15, Revelation 11 verse 15, that the kingdoms, of, the kingdoms of, of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And in the words of Revelation 20, the saints live and reign with Christ a thousand years. So Revelation 11 is parallel to Revelation 20. Revelation 11 verse 15, parallel to Revelation 20 verse 4. Well, what about Revelation 12? Come back with me to Revelation 6, because there's another parallel here between Revelation 6 and Revelation 12. Because you see, it says in Revelation 6 and in verse 12, in the sixth seal, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake, the sun became black as the sackcloth of hair, the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Wow! Isn't that precisely what occurred in Revelation 12, verse 4? The dragon cast a third of the stars of heaven down to the earth. And I might add, these are the only two occasions in the book of Revelation 
where you read of stars falling to the earth. Revelation 6 verse 13 and Revelation 12 verse 4. So what I'm saying is, Revelation 6 and Revelation 12 are the same time period. One religious, the other civil. Yes, yes, but the same time period. And so you've got two parallel time periods running right through to the return of Christ and the establishment of the kingdom age where Revelation 11 and Revelation 20 coincide once again. Well, that demystifies the entire structure of the book of Revelation. That's the story, you see, of the book of Revelation. Now, what do you have to remember out of all I've just said? It's very simple. Firstly, the whole, all the chapters in the book of Revelation are of one of two sorts. They're either a kingdom vision or they are a history chapter. Point number two, the history chapters describe either the political history of the Roman Empire or the religious history of the Roman Empire. That's the story of the book of Revelation. That's the structure. And those kingdom visions, you can see, simply punctuate that political or secular history to give hope to the saints of each age that no matter what befalls them, God's in control and their future is planned. Wow. The other implication from that is, if we're going to talk about the 50 years required to set up the kingdom age, which by and by we shall do, you'll appreciate that that's going to touch Revelation 11, Revelation 17, 18, 16, 19. We're going to have to talk about the kingdom vision of Revelation 10, because that bears upon this section. And the whole structure of that 50 years is contained in Revelation 14. So it might appear as though we're jumping all over the book of Revelation, but when you look at it like this, it's really not so. We've got a couple of kingdom visions, but all the rest of those chapters... 11, 16, 17, 18, they are contemporary chapters in the chronology of the book of Revelation. I hope you find that simple. I find that quite simple. And that's how the book of Revelation works. Well, we're not finished because there's another point to understand. You'll be aware that in the book of Revelation we have seals, we have trumpets, we have vials, we have thunders. Come back with me to Revelation 6. Or we're there. There was a scroll in Revelation 5 verse 1 which began to be opened and in Revelation 6 verse 1 it says, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard as it were the noise of thunder. Then verse 3, he opened the second seal. Verse 5, he opened the third seal. Verse 7, the fourth seal. Verse 9, the fifth seal. Verse 12, the sixth seal. And then it misses chapter 7, because of course chapter 7 is a kingdom vision, and jumps straight to chapter 8, and he opens the seventh seal. There was silence in heaven, about half an hour, and in verse 2 of chapter 8, I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets, and blow me down. The moment the seventh seal is opened, the seven trumpets begin. So can you see that the seventh seal of Revelation chapter 8 contains the seven trumpets. And you're going to find, if you keep reading, that the seventh trumpet contains the seven vials, and the seventh vial contains the seven thunders. So there's like a telescopic approach between seals, trumpets, vials, and thunders in the book of Revelation. All right? Well, what are the seals, trumpets, vials, and thunders? And the answer is this. They're all judgments. They're judgments on the successive phases of the Roman Empire over time. That's all they are. The seventh, uh, sorry, the, the seven seals judge the Roman Empire between 96 AD when John wrote the book of Revelation and 324 AD when that phase of the Roman Empire ceased and the next phase began. The trumpets began to judge the next phase up until the French Revolution of 1789. The vials of Revelation judged that next phase of the Roman Empire from the French Revolution to the Battle of Armageddon. And then the thunders happen after Armageddon in the 50-year period as the kingdom is set up. 
judgment one after the other on the Roman Empire. Now you might say to me, well hang on, the Roman Empire has been and gone. The Caesars, where are they? They no longer exist. But think hard about Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 says there are four beasts and then the kingdom of God. So evidently the fourth beast has a 2,000 year life or a, what, 2,100 year life between the formation of the, of the Roman Empire as a world empire and the return of Jesus Christ. So that there is a capacity, therefore, in which the Roman Empire still exists today. And that capacity, of course, is in the Roman religious system. So we have 2,000 years of judgments upon the Roman Empire. Well, this is how it works. Remember I showed you that slide just a few moments ago about the beast, the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7, appearing in Revelation 12, 10 horns, Revelation 13, 10 horns, Revelation 17, 10 horns. Well, the seals, those six seals, which open into the seventh seal, they judge the pagan Roman Empire, the great red dragon with 10 horns of Revelation chapter 12. And in 324, the hammer comes down and the great red dragon disappears and is replaced by the beast of the sea of Revelation 13. Ten horns, a different beast. What was the difference? He changes from paganism to Christianity. And then the trumpets erupt and begin to judge the Christian Roman Empire from 324 AD through to the French Revolution. Now, the Christian Roman Empire is interesting because one of the heads of the Christian Roman Empire, the imperial head, was by far the most powerful. So powerful, that, in fact, that a separate beast is given to represent that head. So the beast of the sea, seven heads, ten horns, the seventh head is amplified as the beast of the earth, a lamb masquerading as the lamb of God, a false religious lamb, the Holy Roman Empire from 800 to 1800 AD. 1806 AD, destroyed by Napoleon at the conclusion of the vials. But the Roman Empire wasn't destroyed by Napoleon. It only went into the abyss and it comes back out when the European Union is created in 1957 as the scarlet coloured beast of Revelation 17, ridden by a woman, ridden by the Catholic Church. Don't you know that the European Union is a Catholic club? Turkey, as much as she wants to join the European Union, can never join the European Union. Why? She's a Muslim country. Well, what barrier would that be? Her economy is stronger than Greece. It's stronger than Italy. They're both in the EU. Well, because the Pope says no. That's why. So Turkey has stopped trying to join the EU. The beast, the scarlet coloured beast of Revelation 17 is ridden by the Catholic Church. It's driven by the Catholic Church. It's a Catholic club. But it will be judged by the seven thunders after Christ returns, and destroyed. So that's, that's what the seals, trumpets, vials, and thunders are. They are simply judgments upon the successive uh, phases of the Roman Empire over the last couple of thousand years and into the future. And there's just one other feature in the book of Revelation that you have to appreciate. There are a number of earthquakes in the book of Revelation but three times those earthquakes are called great earthquakes. And the reason they're called great earthquakes is because there is a sea change in the empire. So there's a great earthquake when Constantine came in 324 and changed the Roman Empire from pagan to Christian. And the way that's described, well, we're in Revelation chapter 6. I mean, look at what it says in Revelation 6 verse 13. The stars of heaven fell to the earth, so all the pagan... Um, aristocracy, was thrown out of office. There was a great earthquake. The sun became black as a sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood, so all the old rulers completely lost their power. A great cloud came upon the old pagan empire, and the heaven departed as a scroll, as it was rolled together. So there was a new heavens and a new earth, as it were, when the Roman Empire changed from pagan to Christian. A great earthquake. It rocked the Roman world when Constantine did that. And it began a new, a new beast. That's the thing. The great red dragon of Revelation 12 lost his life in 324 AD 
and was reborn instantly as the beast of the sea of Revelation chapter 13. I've been asked before, you know, there's been, you know, in the Brotherhood at times, debate on the vials of Revelation chapter 16. Because those vials all take place within a very short few decades, 30 odd years, the first five vials of Revelation 16, under the control of Napoleon. And the question has arisen, you know, if you think about the timeline we just had on the screen, maybe I've got it here. You look at the timeline on the screen, we've got the seals go for a number of hundreds of years, the trumpets go for many, many hundreds of years, the vials, one, two, three, four, five, it's all in a very short period, actually. I mean, I can't make it as small as it needs to be for scale on the screen there, but Napoleon's work was done in a very short time. And the question has obviously often been asked, have we got the right interpretation of Revelation chapter 16 when we've got long-term judgments of the seals and the trumpets, but all the vials are compressed into a very small moment of time? Really? Is there not something more major happening? Do you understand what Napoleon Bonaparte did? At the Battle of Austerlitz in 1806, he destroyed the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Empire. The Holy Roman Emperor abdicated control of the empire and became solely the emperor of Austria. What does that mean in the context of the book of Revelation? It means that Napoleon Bonaparte killed the beast of the earth. He killed one of the great beasts of the book of Revelation, a beast that was born in 800 AD under Charlemagne, lived for a thousand years. Bonaparte killed it in the space of 30 years. Well, that is absolutely significant. Absolutely significant, you see. No, no, we do have the right interpretation of the Napoleonic vials in Revelation chapter 16. And this is what Revelation looks like when you put it all together and collect up the history, the parallel sections of history, the visions, and the judgments, the seals, the trumpets, the vials, the thunders. That's what the book of Revelation looks like. There's the structure of the book of Revelation. As we've explained already, we're going to look at the last 50 years, which runs right through many of those chapters on the right-hand side of that chart. It's a magnificent story. It's not a hard structure to understand, and it's mighty powerful when you come to look at it. Now come with me to Revelation 16. Let's put ourselves on the map now, in the book of Revelation. There's the structure. There's how things look. What about us? Where do we feature? Well, you're very familiar with Revelation 16 and verse 16. He gathered them together to a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now, that is the conclusion of the sixth vial. The sixth vial began in verse 12 in Revelation chapter 16 with the drying up of the river Euphrates, so the shrinking of the Turkish Empire from about 1820 onwards. It concludes with the Battle of Armageddon, and then in verse 17 of Revelation 16, the seventh angel pours out his vial into the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it's done. It's done. So you can see straight away there's something enormously significant occurring in Revelation 16. 16 and verse 17. What's done? Revelation 16, verses 17 to the end of the chapter is the seventh vial. And that is, if you could think of it like this, that's the last 40 of the 50-year time period we spoke about yesterday. Because it begins at the Battle of Armageddon and concludes with the establishment of the Kingdom Age. And when I say it's done, and I ask the question, what's done? I, I can tell you very quickly in verse 19, what's done? The great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the nations fell. Great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of, of his wrath. Great Babylon is destroyed. The scarlet-colored beast of Revelation 17 is destroyed in verse 19 of Revelation 16. The kingdom of men has come to an end. It's done. That's what's done. Now, let me just show you something. 
Verse 17 concludes, it's done. So what we're saying is essentially, at the commencement of the millennium, at the conclusion of the 50 years, we have destroyed the kingdom of men, and it's done. We come across the page to Revelation 21, verse 6. Revelation 21 and verse 6. Well, let me just show you Revelation 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Revelation 21 is describing the time after the completion of the thousand years. The sea here represents the sea of nations. In the thousand year reign of Christ, the sea in Revelation chapter 4 becomes like glass. So the nations are a troubled sea today. Revelation chapter 15 describes a time where the sea is mixed with fire, so judgment comes upon the sea. Revelation 4, after year 50, the sea becomes glass. For a thousand years, the nations are at rest, up until the final uprising. And once that's quelled, Revelation 21, the Ad Olam, the the eighth thousand year, if you like, no more sea, no more mortality, no more sin. And it says in Revelation 21, verse 6, he said to me, It's done. So isn't that incredible? At the commencement of the thousand years, it's done. At the conclusion of the thousand years, it's done. Well, evidently, at the commencement of the thousand years, it wasn't completely done. Because more work had to occur. There was a second judgment, a second resurrection. But what was done at the start of the thousand years was that the kingdom of men was destroyed. What's done at the end of the thousand years is that sin and mortality are destroyed. And God's name is now extant to the ex- in the earth to the exclusion of flesh and blood. All right, back to Revelation 16. So it's a significant phrase that it's done. But what you're reading in Revelation 16 and verse 17 is, in fact, a summary of the seventh vial. Verse 17 says, it's the seventh vial. There's a great voice from the temple of heaven saying, it's done. And what you read from verses 18 through to the end of Revelation 16 is how it's done, just exactly what has to happen to make it done. And you can see that great Babylon is destroyed in verse 19. That's what's done. But verse verse 17 says that this angel pours out his vial into the air. Now, what does that mean? Well, a vial is a bowl, like a bowl of water. He pours out this bowl of judgment into the air. Now, there's no point pouring anything just into the air. So the air here is a symbol. A symbol of what? A symbol of government. You'll read all the way through Revelation chapter 16, the vial is poured out on the earth in verse 2, on the sea in verse 3, on the rivers in verse 4. So poured out on different geographical regions. Here, it's poured into the air. The government of this age in Ephesians 2 verse 2 is called the prince of the power of the air. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, you'll remember, uh, the resurrection occurs, we're caught up in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That is, to meet the Lord in government. So the air, being a place above the earth, is the region of government. It's a, it's a symbolic biblical term for government. And the seventh angel pours out his vial upon the government of the kingdom of men and destroys it. Destroys it. The air in verse 17, is in contrast to the temple of heaven in verse 17. This is the government of Jesus Christ. So the government of Jesus Christ judges the government of the kingdom of men. That's really what we're reading in Revelation 16 and verse 17. The consequence of which is, it's done. And here's the detail. Verse 18, this is how it was done. Voices, thunders, lightnings, and a great earthquake, it says. Let me just tell you, the voices will be the voices of the Mid-Heaven Proclamation in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. The thunders will be the the, the, the seven thunder judgments of Revelation chapter 10 and verse 4. A great earthquake, of course a great earthquake in Revelation 16 and verse 18, because this is the fall of the entire empire of the kingdom of men. Great Babylon Three parts, a city in three parts in verse 19, it says, fell. What are the three parts of great Babylon? Verse 13, dragon, beast, false prophet. They're all doomed. 
in Revelation 16 and verse 19. Every island fled away, verse 20. The mountains were not found. Islands, mountains, these are symbols of rulers. Mountains in scripture are symbols of, of empires. Hills would, would be little empires. So these are the various nations of the earth running for cover. And there fell upon men, in verse 21, a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. So the nations of this world, evidently, are brought into the kingdom age, kicking and screaming. That's why Daniel 2 says that the Lord will break in pieces and bruise all of these kingdoms. Revelation 16 is the high-level view of the 50-year period, the subjugation of the kingdom of men and the imposition of the kingdom of God. The detail behind Revelation 16, the seventh vial, just precisely how it happens is contained in Revelation chapter 14, and that, as you now know, is the subject of our next study.